like that video. You just kind of glide into the sermon. You know. But it's good to be here with you all. Good morning. Um, normally I get to be at the 9 o'clock service with our students, so it's good to be here with you this morning. And uh, Glenkirk, i got to say, you ought to be really proud of the students that are here at Glenkirk. They are changing. God's changing their lives. God's moving in their lives. And I'm excited to see what God does in the next generation at Glenkirk because they are incredible. So if you see them, say hi to them. They love to get to know you. They are great, great people. So thanks for uh, continued prayers there. But I'm thankful to continue our breakout series. We've been in the past 10 weeks here in the book of Acts, and we've been journeying through the book of Acts as we look at the movement of Jesus in the early church. Church. So two weeks ago, we looked at the stoning of Stephen, and Stephen, uh, uh, Stephen was uh, stoned by Saul, who we're looking at today, and Saul approved of that stoning, and the result is that a persecution breaks out in Jerusalem. All but the 12 apostles stay in Jerusalem, but the, the rest of the Jesus' disciples break out across the walls of Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria, where they take the message of Christ with them. Right, they're on the run, but luckily they can talk while they're on the run, and they spread the message of Jesus Christ throughout the surrounding areas. Last week, we continued the story of the breakout with the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Pastor Tim talked about how we have a get up and go God, and he tells Philip to get up and go onto the road to Jerusalem that leads to Gaza. And God uses Philip to convert the Ethiopian eunuch, and he's converted and baptized on the spot. That was last week. Now this week, we continue the breakout series with another conversion story, and it's conversion of a terrorist. It's the conversion of Saul, later known, later called, the Apostle Paul. So let's dive into the text. We will be in Acts 9, and we'll start in the very first verse in Acts 9. And we can follow along how you'd like, but the verse will be on the screen. Let's start in Acts 9, verse 1. This is what it says. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for a letter to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. We'll stop there for a second. So the Saul that was mentioned in the stoning of Stephen is now front and center in the story. I was talking to Tim this week, and he goes, oh, man, Dusty had a tough time given up this, this sermon this week, because it's a really good story, and it is a good story. One uh, commentator talked about how this might be, uh, is one of the most important, if not the most important text uh, that, that we have in the book of Acts written by Luke. Um, and Tim, you gave it to the youth pastor. So I don't know how that says about, about how we, where we're here this morning, but I'm excited to be here, and I'm excited to uh, uh, talk about it. Um, and the reason we're here is that Saul becomes the Apostle Paul, and the reason why it's so important is that he extends the message of Christianity all throughout the Mediterranean world. He's one of the central figures, one of the figures that God uses to extend the message of Christianity. So, who is this guy? He's a special guy. He's one of the focused main guys that, that, that brings the message um, out. Who is he? Glad you asked. So, uh, Saul. He's born in Tarsus. It's a part of the metro, a metropolis of Cilicia. He was born to a devout Jewish family, and he's very well educated. He was brought up speaking Hebrew, Aramaic, but his original language was probably Greek. And being that he was from Cilicia, he probably spoke the Cilician language as well, and maybe possibly Latin. So whew, that's a very educated uh, a guy who grew up under um, being mentored by, being uh, educated by the esteemed Pharisee Gamaliel. So we have in Paul, we have in Saul, known as uh, Paul, is a very well-educated Jewish man. He has access to the elites in society, and he absolutely hates the disciples of Jesus Christ. He's present at the stoning of Stephen, and we're, set, we're told that he's breathing out murderous threats. It's the description of like an animalistic havoc that he's wreaking in the disciples of Jesus Christ in the early church. And he has a strategy. He has a strategy to expand his persecution among the early church. This is what it says the strategy is. He knows that the synagogues in the area, they respect the high priest. And so he goes to the high priest, gets letters from the high priest to bring to the synagogues for them to, to say, we want to gather all the names and the addresses of the disciples 
seek them out, arrest them, and transport them back to Jerusalem. Saul's on a mission, right? It's not a good one. He's a powerful man, he's a smart man, and he's an evil man who's the enemy of God and his people. But the story doesn't stop there. Let's keep on reading Acts 9. We'll read verses 3 through 9. The story continues. And it says, As he neared, that is Saul, as he neared Damascus on his journey, journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. So Saul is on his way to persecute the disciples in Damascus. Saul is an enemy, of course, once again, of his, uh, Christ and his followers, and he stands against what God is doing through his people. And he sees a flash of light. There's a dramatic moment where, where God gets a hold of him. He's a flash of light. Christ reveals himself. He sees Christ face to face, and he's knocked down. And he has an audible voice say to him, calls him by name, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, of course, Saul doesn't know who's talking to him, but he knows this person's in charge, and this person is the Lord. And he says, I am, Jesus says, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. Let's stop right there for a second. So this event is a sudden striking event, but it's not the first time that Jesus shows up in his life. It's a sudden event, it's a quick event, it's a decisive event, but it's not the first time that Saul shows up, I mean, that, that Jesus shows up in Saul's life. He's been in Saul's life for a long time. And he's showing up partly, if not mainly, in Jesus' followers that he's persecuting. He's arresting, killing disciples full of the Holy Spirit, and they're witnessing for Christ. And it's got to be difficult for Saul to continue to push against Christ when he sees disciples full of the Holy Spirit being persecuted right in front of him. Saul admits later in Acts that Christ calls him out for kicking against the goads, which is resisting the surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ. It's a struggle leading to conversion, and this struggle that leads to conversion is not unique. Some of you have experienced it. Uh, C.S. Lewis, some of you guys are, are familiar with C.S. Lewis, he experienced it, the great novelist, lay theologian. He described his struggle resisting God and God's work in his life. This is what C.S. Lewis says about his description of surrendering to Jesus Christ. He says, I became aware I was holding something at bay or shutting something out. Or, if you like, that I was wearing some stiff clothing like corsets or even a suit of armor as if I were a lobster. I felt myself being, there and then, given a free choice. I could open the door or keep it shut. I could unbuckle the armor or keep it on. Neither choice was presented as a duty. No threat or promise was attached to either. Though I knew that to open the door or to take off the corset meant the incalculable. I chose to open, to unbuckle, to loosen the rein. I say I choose, yet it did not really seem possible to do the opposite. So C.S. Lewis describes this relentless pursuit of God on his life. It's a pursuit you may be familiar with. It's a pursuit that some of you may be familiar with right now. You're fighting God, you're resisting God. And if you're fighting and resisting God, don't. God's too big for you. Right? He's a God we surrender to, not a God we fight against. And the question for some of us in the room is, will you let him in? Will you let God get a hold of more of who you are? Will you surrender? Will you submit to lordship? If so... You're going to open yourself up to uncertainty, but you're in for an adventure. You really are. And what does that adventure look like? What kind of adventure does this look like? Well, let's keep on reading and we'll find out as we look at the person of Ananias. 
So remember, Paul is blinded, and he's escorted by traveling companions to Damascus, and we pick up the story there. So we'll look at uh, Acts 9, 10 through 12. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street, Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. So I love this interaction between um, Jesus and Ananias. Jesus calls and Ananias knows him. It's a response of someone in relationship with God. Someone who knows God. Someone who's trained in listening to the voice of God. Someone who's mature in their spiritual walk. Trained, listening to the voice of God. And they're ready to obey it. Ananias. Yes, Lord. Or as some translations say, here I am, Lord. It's a response of someone with a father, which God is, and he's ready to obey. So Ananias receives, right after this, he receives instruction. But I don't want to move too quick to the instruction and the task and the obedience without missing the relationship. It's a relationship between God and Ananias. It's one of trust and intimacy. God knows and trusts Ananias, otherwise he wouldn't come to him. And Ananias knows and trusts God, otherwise there would be no yes, Lord. See, God's not interested in robots. People who show up, receive a task, off to the races without interacting on an intimate personal level. Right? He says, Ananias, yes, Lord. There's intimacy, trust, relationship already there. Ananias is ready. And all Ananias does flows from his relationship with God. The strength of your ministry and the strength of Glenn Kirk's ministry will be its relationship with God. Right? It won't be its money. It won't be its talent. It won't be our, the time and dedication that we put to our ministry. It will first and foremost start with our relationship with God. Because if God gets you, he gets everything. If God gets me, he gets everything. If God gets us, he gets everything. He gets our time, our talent, our treasures, and also our location and where we're at. Ananias says, here I am at this location. I'm ready to give what you want me to give. Right now, Glenn Kirk's in, uh, in transition looking for a new senior pastor. And part of the relevant church profile we have for a new senior pastor is that they're looking at our location. Where are we at? What's our surrounding demographics? Who are we? And how might that be relevant to what, how God will use us where we're at? Saul going to Damascus, so he calls Ananias in Damascus. He's got a guy there, right? So he knows he wants to go into Damascus to use Ananias, and Ananias is ready right where he's at, completely relevant to the mission he has for God. So I have a question. Do we have a posture of here I am, God? Here we are, Father, as a church. Because we serve a get up and go God, as Tim mentioned, and he's on a mission, he has a purpose, he's living and active, and so will I get up and go, and will God find me saying, Yes, Lord, will he find a yes, Lord, people in us? Because all true and great ministry is initiated by God and responded to by us. The great thing about surrender, it's not that we live our mission for God. The great thing about surrender is that God's free to live him, his mission through us. It's a powerful thing when we say, God, Lord, what would you have me do today? Yes, Lord. I'm ready to say yes, Lord. Here I am, Lord. What would you have me do today? All right, and it sounds good, but it's sometimes not easy. It's not the easiest thing in the world because I love Ananias' response to Jesus' call. I love that Luke it includes it because it doesn't really make him look that great. Um, let's see what he says. Acts, Acts 9, 13 through 14. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. You ever feel like you need to tell God something he already knows? 
right? You feel like you need to say, look, God, I know you know. I'm in a posture of obedience. I'm in a posture to receive you. I'm in a posture to go. I'm in a yes, Lord posture. But I just feel like I need to know, let you know what you already know, right? So God says, <clears throat> Ananias, you're going to go to a terrorist who has his eyes closed. You're going to walk up and you're going to put your hands on him, right? Not the greatest greatest uh, concoction for, for a great time, right? So Ananias says, okay, great, yeah, Lord, so I know you're telling me to do this. I know you know, but just so you know that I know what you know, um, this may not go well, right? M maybe you've had this experience, so God's, I don't know, maybe calling you to, to volunteer at VBS, so you go, yeah, right, so I know you know, God, but kids terrify me, so that may not work out the best moving forward, right? But the good thing is God doesn't take direction from us. <laughs> He's not obedient to us. We're obedient to him. And let's think of the phrase, no, Lord. It's kind of an oxymoron, right? No, Lord doesn't make any sense. Lord means that we are available to him for his purposes and his ways. Our answer is always, yes, Lord, to what he asks of us. God knows what he's about. He knows what he's talking about. As God, uh, as, as God works in our lives, Pastor Tim talked about it, God has already given us everything we need to fulfill the mission he has for us. God's already given us everything we need to fulfill the mission he has for us. God's not asking, us, God not asking something of us that we don't have the ability to already do, that he's going to provide for the ability for us to do. Our job is to say, yes, Lord, and God's job is to provide for us along the way as we say Yes, to what he has for us. There's a great quote by the early church theologian, St. Augustine. He's a brilliant man, converted from li uh, a life of self-centeredness and promiscuity in his early 30s. And he has a prayer. St. Augustine has a prayer. It says, Lord, grant what thou commandest, and commandest what thou wilt. Lord, grant what thou commandest, and commandest what thou wilt. What he's saying is, God, give me the ability to do whatever you ask me to do, and ask me to do whatever you want me to do. Give me the ability to do whatever you want me to do, and then ask me whatever you want me to do. It's exactly what God does here. He does it through Ananias, and he's about to do it through Saul. Um, but it's the next line that gives me pause. Um, it makes me want to put all this in perspective a little bit and count the cost of what it means to actually say yes, Lord, to this Lord. Um, let's continue reading in Acts 9, verse 16. This is what verse 16 says about Paul's, Saul's ministry. It says, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Suffer? Right? Now, Saul's ministry is unique, but suffer is not something we usually put alongside our Christian life. There's this false narrative in, our, in Christian culture sometimes, right? It's I give my life to Christ, I get a ticket out of hell, then our life is kind of a happily ever after from then until we get to heaven, whatever that is, right? It's a common narrative, but it's a false narrative. And it's a, it's a narrative that leads to um, country club Christianity, right? There's a big difference between the life of discipleship and the country club Christianity. But don't get me wrong. I love the country club. The country club is awesome. I didn't grow up in a country club family. I grew up in a more of a par three family, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Some of you guys grew up in a par three family, didn't spend a lot of time at the country club. But when I was in high school, I got to go to a wedding reception at the Glendora Country Club. It was great. Um, and I didn't know how to really react or act in a country club. But, you know, there's servers walking around with, like, these great appetizers, right? And I don't know what I'm doing, so I ask stupid questions like, are those free? Right? <laughs> And they're like, yes, do you like one? Um, so I'm like, well, praise the Lord. And so you look at the appetizers, and they're like these, these mini sausages with like cheese over them, then wrapped in bacon with like a sauce over them. You just want to sing the doxology, right? So <laughs> praise God from. And then that wasn't it. So then I found out there were free drinks from the first hour. And that was too good to be true for me. So I kind of walk up to the, to, the, to the bar with like a uh, kind of a stealth mentality, like, hey, so uh, Mr. Bartender, I hear that there are free drinks. Is that true? He's like, yes, what can I get you? And I go, oh, really? Well, okay. Shirley Temple, thank you very much. Appreciate that. 
<laughs> Can I get an extra cherry on that? Oh, good. Okay, well, thank you very much. Great. This is great. And so I tried to be kind of poised, but inside I'm just like, this is, this is like all about, I felt like it was kind of all about me, right? This is great. This is awesome. Um, now, I didn't grow up with this experience, but my friend, um, one of my best friends growing up, his family belonged to a country club, and he said, the great thing about a country club, nobody's there who annoys you. It's awesome. They're kinda, it's kind of all about you, right? And uh, then you come to the church, right? Annoying people everywhere. Just absolutely everywhere. I annoy myself half the time, so I can't imagine what other people have to experience. But um, Francis Chan, so the pastor named Francis Chan, he talks about the body of Christ and life in the church. He says, you know, like, I know we all have a function and we all have a function in the body of Christ. But some people, you kind of ask them, you kind of ask the question, what function are you? What part of the body are you? Are you like the appendix? I know you can blow up and kill us all, but I'm not sure about what you actually do in the body of Christ. Thank goodness we have donuts in the patio. Otherwise, some of you wouldn't even be here, right? Holy Spirit and donuts. That's what's keeping some of you here. Um, but the reality is what gets us out of bed to come to church, to, to live the Christian life, is not that it's all about us. The great reality of the Christian church is that it's about Jesus and Jesus Christ crucified. It's about putting him at the center of our life. It's what Saul did eventually. It's what Ananias is doing, and he's willing to live out what Christ has for his life. He has a yes, Lord, posture despite everything that's stacked against him, despite all the uncomfortable things he has to navigate as a Christian, despite the sacrifice that he might have to make. And so Saul does it, we will see, and Ananias does it. So we get to see Ananias acting in obedience to what God calls him to. Let's keep on reading. We've, we've talked about Saul separately and Ananias separately. Then they come together. Let's read uh, Acts 9, 17 through 19. When Ananias went to the house um, and entered it, that's the house where Saul's staying, he placed his hands on Saul and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from, the Saul, from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. So remember, it's been three days where Saul and Ananias have been separate. Saul's blind, he has no food, no drink, and he's simply praying. And remember verse 12, Lord tells Ananias that Saul gets a vision that someone puts hands on him to restore his sight. So he's ready for that. But I don't think he was ready for what Ananias was going to say. It was going to come out of his mouth. So remember, Saul's a terrorist. He's skilled at capturing, killing disciples of Jesus Christ. Then he comes face to face with Jesus himself. And I can only imagine what was going through Saul's head after his experience with Christ. I'm sure he sees the faces of people he has killed or persecuted. Then he hears the words of Jesus Christ, right? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. He must be completely broken, completely devastated as a sinner, a wretched man. He must be thinking, I am absolutely nothing. But what comes out of Ananias' mouth is what we all want to hear, and it makes all the difference. Ananias enters the house. He sees Paul blind, weak, walks over, puts a hand on his shoulder, and the first words that come out of his mouth are, Brother Saul. Brother Saul. Wow, he receives a touch that says, look, I'm here for you. You're not alone. Then he receives words that says, you're family. You belong among God's people. Can you imagine, after all he's done, after all his evil, after he, he's literally persecuted and killed Christians, sitting in that shame and that pain for three days, and he has someone embrace him physically and affirm him vocally that you are family. You're here. And he's healed. Something like scales fall from his eyes. He's healed. He's baptized, which is a sign of entering into a family, into the family of Jesus Christ, the outward sign of the inward grace of what's happened to Saul. And he eats and he's strengthened. He's completely new. A few weeks ago, I got to teach the kids. And uh, they had a memory verse in small groups. It was Galatians 2.20, which Paul wrote to the church in Galatia. Here's what Paul says. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. 
It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live, I live by faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He's completely free. He's a new man, all through Jesus Christ. And Ananias' work and obedience in that to free Saul from the sin that he had been under. And we don't have time to continue, but he goes home. Paul, Saul continues, and he goes on mission and spreads that around uh, the Mediterranean area and especially to the Gentiles. And it's the reason, part of the reason why we're here this morning. Paul writes 13 books of the 27 books in the New Testament, and he's largely responsible for who we are today, right, as a Christian church. So I think that's what we'll find. We'll find God doing this stuff among us, in us, through us, if we have a yes, Lord, posture to a get up and go God. Who knows, maybe it will be used to convert a terrorist among us, or transform a city, or transform the life of God, the life of, of someone who's made in God's image. He will use us if we have a le- yes, Lord, attitude for a get up and go God. But it's most likely going to cost us something, right? There's a cost to discipleship. But if we don't have that, pay that cost, we miss out on the adventure that God has for us. So let's be a yes, Lord, people to a get up and go God. I'm excited to give you homework this morning. I can never give homework to students because they cringe, right? But we have homework. Because uh, the strength of our ministry will come from our relationship with God. So three things that I'm going to do this week and I think we all can do, is wake up each morning and say, Lord, you are present here. Lord, you're present here. Then meditate on Ananias' words, yes, Lord, or here I am, Lord. Then open up your hands and say, Lord, what would you have me do today? And listen, listen, watch for what God might have you do. Lord, you are present here. I have a yes, Lord attitude. Now, Lord, what would you have me do today? All right, let's pray. Father, we come before you through your Son and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for teaching us through this story about your work in the life of Saul and your work through the life of Ananias, Father. God, we know you're the same God today that you were then. You are a God on the move that loves to call us to get up and go. Father, may that call in our lives come from an intimate relationship with you, Father. Give us a heart that's ready to say yes, Lord, to what you might call us to do. God, we do pray that you would give us the ability to do what you've called us to do, and that you would call us to do whatever you want us to do. God, we know there's people like Saul out there who are your enemies. They live against you, apart from you, in spiritual blindness. But God, empower us to be a people who's ready to be a part of the transforming work that you want to do in the lives of those around us, Father. May we be a yes, Lord, people. But we, Lord, we ask that you would not be a, we would not be a people who simply takes orders from you, but God, we want to live a life with you in intimate relationship. God, may the strength of our ministry come from our relationship with you. Empower each of us individually, God, and all of us collectively as your people, Lord, and break out among us continually. Father, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.